Hello everyone. And we have an opening song. Please feel free to sing along with your mics on mute. Now, uh, as we begin our service, I would like to start with a land recognition. We pause to acknowledge that the land we are living on has borne witness to thousands of years of indigenous culture, history and experience. We are all fortunate to have found a home here and are challenged to think about our collective and individual relationship with the land and all its inhabitants, both human and non-human, and how we can enhance these relationships. As Unitarians, our first principle respects the worth and dignity of every person. Here in Amiskwasiwaskahikan, or Edmonton, we are on Treaty 6 land. I invite those joining us from further afield to type the treaty or non-ceded land they inhabit into the chat. Welcome, we're glad you found us. Welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation. We are a compassionate community of free religious thought and we invite you to rest, grow and serve the world. My name is Cassie Aziz Few. Our tech wizards this morning are Brenda Jackson and Bill Lee, with extra help from um, Robbie Bryden, our speaker. M our musicians today are Jennifer McMillan and Rebecca Patterson, and our speaker is Robbie Bryden, a Westwood member who now resides in Burlington with his wife Joanna and their young family. Now I invite you to light a chalice at home if you have one, as I read the opening words and chalice lighting. The opening words are taken from Singing the Living Tradition, number 468. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted. We need one another when we are in trouble or afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. We need one another in the time of success, when we look for someone to share our triumphs. We need one another in the hour of defeat, when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us. So I light the chalice here 
in the spirit of community. There it is. <laughs> now we join in the cherished tradition of Unitarian Universalists in many places as we may choose to tell each other about the joys and concerns that are uppermost in our lives. It helps to bring us closer together as a community to know our celebrations and our sorrows are shared. Please type your joys or concerns in the chat now while Jennifer plays a musical interlude. Please join me in the affirmation with your mics on mute. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal, not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. And now, a joke. The joke is of the Christian variety and apologies to all the non-Christians in the audience. A man died and he went to heaven. He was met at the pearly gates by St. Peter who led him down the golden streets. They passed stately homes and beautiful mansions until they came to the end of the street where they stopped in front of a rundown cabin. The man asked St. Peter why he got a hut when there were so many mansions he could live in. St. Peter replied, I did the best with the money you sent us. So thank you everyone for the money you send to Westwood. I hope we do our best with it too. Donations to Westwood are gratefully received by Interac eTransfer to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. For other ways to donate, please go to our website and click on the donate button. We also value your time and talents. And now, Rebecca's offertory song. Please sing along while muted. From you I receive to you Together we share, and from this we live, 
Thank you. And now we are very pleased to welcome back Robbie Bryden to talk to us about this month's theme, Momentum. His talk is uh, called Momentum is Real. Robbie Bryden is a member of Westwood Unitarian who now lives three provinces away in Burlington, Ontario, with his partner Joanna and children Charlie and Wally. He leads an initiative on income security and health at McMaster University, where he coordinated evaluation of Ontario's basic income pilot before its untimely demise. While in Edmonton, he worked for Homewood Trust, curled at Crestwood, and loved eating at Bodega, and attended the Folk Festival every year. So it's over to you now, Robbie. Thank you, Cassie. Let's start today in high school. Not your high school, whatever your experience there was, or is right now, if any of you are in high school, either as students or as teachers. My high school, Lure Collegiate in Toronto, a relatively small school for the city with about 700 students. I played volleyball and we had a pretty good team. I could tell you a few stories about that, about the, the two years we didn't get to play because of work to rule actions by teachers in response to the unreasonable demands of a provincial government. Something I'm sure you're not at all familiar with right now in Alberta. I could tell you a story about the first championship we won when the school had come down to a, uh, where the game was being played downtown and Students came rushing onto the court to celebrate their first sports title in 20 years. Or the finals the following year, when my error on game point was saved by the heroics of two of my teammates, first my best friend and then, and then the smallest player on the team, putting the ball over the net from the back of the gym. Several tiebreak points later, we still lost that match, but it remains the best game I have ever played. However, this is not a story about salvation. It is a story about momentum. So it comes two games later. After that city final, we had to win twice more against regional teams to qualify for the provincials. We won our first game handily, but the second game did not start well. We dropped the first set and we were trailing 23 to 18 in the next one. Two more points for the other team and our season would be over. Instead, we scored 15 straight points to not only win the second set, but take an 8-0 lead into the third and deciding set, which only went up to 15. And then we lost. One moment, we scored 15 straight points. The next, we surrendered 15 without being able to score five. What happened? It was the same group of teenagers on the court as it was 10 minutes earlier, and 10 minutes before that but something changed, the momentum. With two equally matched teams playing each other, if each point did not depend on the last point, the probability of our team scoring 15 straight times would be about one in 33,000. But each point is not independent of the last just as each moment in our lives is not independent of what came before. We pivot from probability of physics here, and then I promise I will leave high school behind. In Newton's first law, he identified inertia by stating, every body endeavors to preserve its present state, whether it be of rest or of moving uniformly forward. In other words, when you're rolling, you're rolling, and when you're not, you're not. So what does this mean for us in our day-to-day -day lives? We don't get to play championship games every day, but our successes, our relationships, our moods may sometimes run in streaks. 
just like a sports team with momentum behind them or against them. How does this work? There are lots of ways you could pick this apart, but a simple one is to consider a cycle. Action, feedback, interpretation, action, feedback, interpretation, action, and so on and so forth. We do something, we get a response, or we don't get a response. We interpret that response in a way that has some effect on us. And then we do something else. And the way in which we do the next thing is affected by the way the previous response impacted us. Maybe the impact on our next action, action is subtle, or maybe it's drastic. Maybe the two things we're doing are related, or maybe not at all. This is how the stresses of work can spill over to home, or the hobbies we enjoy in the rest of our lives, uh, or the hobbies we enjoy can make the rest of our lives better. Regardless, this is a pathway by which momentum can build in our lives. Action, feedback, interpretation, action. In my current job, I spend a lot of time alone in front of a computer. It used to be in an office at McMaster, but now happens at an office in my home where I see even fewer people. Recently, I've done a lot of reaching out to people whose work I respect, but whom I don't know well or at all to request their participation in a project. The feedback I get affects me, either adding fuel to the fire or dimming my enthusiasm a little. One of the keys to interrupting negative momentum is learning how to hear no well. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. When I get a positive response, it makes me a little more excited and a little more courageous in reaching out to more people or putting work out into the world, things that can get me more positive feedback cycle of momentum can build. If you're paying attention to that example, you will notice something. I talked about being alone in front of a computer. Most of these invitations I'm sending are by email. How many of you typically get responses within five minutes when you send an email to someone you don't know well? I recognize that you're all muted, but I expect the room would be equally silent even if we were all together in the same physical space. Responses come hours or days or sometimes weeks later. So the action and the feedback are separated. Interpretation, however, the way I hear the response whenever it does come, immediately follows me receiving the feedback. And now my next action is affected by the feedback to an action I took days or weeks earlier. Did that positive note arrive on a day when things were already going well, or maybe on a day that wasn't? If it wasn't clear before from the sports example, momentum has an element, an element of luck involved. What happens if I don't get a response at all? Then there is no prompt for feedback. And the interpretation happens whenever I think about the fact that I haven't heard back. I don't know why the person hasn't responded to me. Maybe they didn't read my email. Maybe they strongly dislike what I've suggested. Or maybe they were really interested and just forgot to send a note. So I have more latitude in possible interpretations, which can make them dangerous. I now get to choose whether I want to follow up or let go of whatever it was I was asking for. Let's pause for a moment here to consider two things. One is how we interpret the messages we get from others. The other is how we give messages. We are social beings. When people say yes or no to us, it affects us. We're wired that way. I have never worked as a telemarketer, but a number of my friends did in high school. And it is a brutal job, hearing no over and over, sometimes in less than polite ways. Good telemarketers, anyone in sales for that matter, learns how to hear no without hearing, I'm not good enough, which is a story we often tell ourselves when someone turns us down. They learn to focus on doing the things that are within their control to get the next person to say yes. 
Likewise, athletes succeed when they believe their skill set is good enough and are able to see their mistakes as opportunities for growth rather than character failings. Alec Manoa is a young pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays with the, in their minor league system currently. And he, he played in spring training and he described his first experiences facing some of the best hitters in baseball by saying, it's good for me to understand that the stuff plays. Just go out there and be yourself. You don't need to be too much. You don't need to shoot yourself down. Just go out there, stay level-headed, and let the game take care of the rest. I just do everything I can control. I repeat that. You don't need to be too much. You don't need to shoot yourself down. Just go out there, stay level-headed, and do everything you can control. What brilliant advice. Second thing I mentioned was the way we give messages. There is value in the way we send messages to others. Some days it's easier, some days it's harder, but when we have the ability to express enthusiasm, it can help build someone else's momentum cycle. The best response I ever received to a request to participate in the project was a one-line email from a professor at Université du Québec à Montréal who wrote, trop cool cette invitation, merci beaucoup, j'accepte avec joie which if your French is a bit rusty, translates to, this invitation is super cool. Thank you so much, I accept with joy. And just like that, she put a smile on my face. So what have I said so far? Yes, momentum is real. We can think about how it builds in our lives through action, feedback, interpretation, action cycles. When we hear yes or no, it affects us but we can learn not to hear no as I'm not good enough and instead focus on what we can control to get to a positive result next time. And we can help support others' momentum through the messages we deliver. We've got two more points left to make this morning. The first is about how momentum operates in groups. People like to be on a winning team. I have zero background in evolutionary psychology, but I gather that there is a survival instinct here in picking the side that is not going to die. This is clearly true in sports, the, the momentum that people like being on a winning team, where the, the bandwagon fans hop on board when a team is doing well, and they tend to greatly outnumber the diehard fans. But it is true in many other arenas too. One of the lessons I learned working at Homeward Trust is that we attracted more support when we were on the path to end homelessness than when we were struggling to fight increasing homelessness. You also see it in electoral politics, and not just because of our weird electoral system, though that matters too. A party that is doing well in opinion polls will attract support, even from people who wouldn't normally agree with the bulk of their policies. My final point is that momentum is real and powerful, but not immutable. The past influences our future, but does not predetermine it. And this is perhaps the most important lesson of all. I participated in the Landmark Forum, a personal development program a dozen years ago. And while I found some of their approaches less than ideal, I found some to be rather useful. One of their little catchphrases is that our past lives in our future. We let ourselves assume that the way things have been is the way they will continue to be. But the future is not preordained. In fact, we have the possibility to be differently than we have been thus far. Landmark introduces some useful skill sets for identifying ways that you are not yet living in line with your values and changing them. My takeaway from their program was that the the most effective way to do this is to communicate to the people who matter to you honestly about how you have been in the past, to commit to being in a new way, to accept that you will not be perfect at it, and to work through hard conversations about how to improve when you do revert to old patterns of behavior. It's not an easy process, but it can work. Let's go back to Newton's description of inertia. Another way of saying that is that an object will continue moving at its current velocity until some force causes its speed or direction to change. Thank you, Wikipedia. 
we have the ability to be differently than we have been in the past, but it will take some work to change course. What are the forces you have in your life to interrupt your progress when you are in a tailspin? Who can you work with when you want to make a significant shift from your current trajectory? And when things are going well, what mechanisms can you lean on to reinforce your momentum? None of us is ever going to avoid all the bumps in the road. So we're gonna need a little push sometimes to keep us rolling. And some of us will need larger pushes and more often if the bumps in our road are bigger. What positive momentum does this congregation have, even in this wacky world of virtual services and meetings that we can capitalize on? And what trajectories are important for us to change? Whenever the congregation is able to gather in person again, we'll mark a time of new beginning when it is easier to start new processes because the momentum of old ones is weaker. There will be a narrow window of opportunity, but the congregation has limited capacity to tackle only so many things. I would encourage, encourage you to choose wisely. Do some, do some exploration and some consideration of what you want to keep going strong and what you perhaps want to change a little bit or a lot. Momentum is real and it can help carry you in the direction you want to go or require a heck of a lot of work to change course when you're barreling down the wrong hill. If you do start to doubt yourself, try to remember Alec Manoa's advice. You don't need to be too much. You don't need to shoot yourself down. Just go out there, stay level-headed, and do everything you can control. Thank you very much, Robbie. That was a very insightful talk and applicable in so many arenas of life. Shortly we'll be uh, holding our closing song. The closing song is number 1074, Turn the World Around, and please join in with your mic muted as you wish. Ha, so is life. Ha.
And now we come to the chalice extinguishing. This is also taken from singing the living tradition. This is number 486. I am being driven forward into an unknown land. The pass grows steeper, the air colder and sharper. A wind from my unknown goal stirs the strings of expectation. Still the question, shall I ever get there? There, where life resounds, a clear, pure note in the silence. Thank you again to all the volunteers who made this Zoom service possible, especially to Robbie for being our speaker. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Next week, we have um, Donovan Hayden from Toronto talking about anti-racism work as a spiritual practice. Please join us again then. <laughs>